الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين رب العالمين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, and to the rest of our guests here a very good evening um, what I'm going to be talking about and I'd like to actually turn it into more of a conversation than a lecture is the concept of science in the Quran but that is sort of abrupt as a topic because it needs a context so I'm going to try to present that context first and then we'll go into some examples of science in the Quran the Quran in Muslim belief is two things in one it's a divine message but at the same time it's also a miracle it's considered a miracle and when we talk about the word miracle I mean the divine message part I think everybody understands any any people that adhere to a religion or a way of life hold certain words to be scripture or to be holy and this is the case with the Muslims with uh, the Quran but it's just important to understand our concept of the word miracle before we go any further because it is a very specific definition that Islam gives to the word that is not applicable in common language. So even though I'm using the word miracle, it's not necessarily what um, you would think of usually. Now I want you to think, where do you use the word miracle? You want me to stop already? Okay, they want me to hold on and come back. But I don't want to waste time, so what I'll do is... I'll talk to you about some things, and when other people come in, I'll start over and I'll quiz you on what I talked about. Okay? This makes our good use of our time. So you signal me and I'll restart. No problem. Okay? Inshallah. Okay? <laughs> so, in common language, nowadays, where do you use the word miracle? You're watching TV. Who would use the word miracle? Doctors? Doctors? Do you use the word miracle? Yeah, sports, definitely. Was, you know, the shot clock's running down, somebody takes a chuck at it from the half court, and it goes in and everybody screams. It's a miracle, right? Basically, also, you know, you call your friends after you, you really tank the exam, and then the day of the grades, you know, you, you go into class and you, you got a 97, and you say, this is, this is a miracle. <laughs> Right? Miracles, basically, what people think of when they think of the word miracle is something really good and unexpected that happens to you or someone else. is a miracle. Somebody's healed, right? Or something really great happens, something very unexpected, highly unlikely. But not impossible. It's highly unlikely, but not impossible. And that's the general connotation of the word miracle in language. But it also has a spiritual sense among religions in general. And in the spiritual sense, it has nothing to do with experiencing something or that something that can be proven. It rather has to do with something you feel in your heart. So you can speak to someone of a particular faith and they can say, well, I believe that such and such religion is a miracle because I felt that miracle in my heart. I feel it and I can't give you that feeling. You'd have to feel it for yourself, right? So it's basically, when we use the word in the spiritual sense, what you're, tr what you're actually saying is it's not something provable at all. It's not something that can be gauged in scientific terms. It's a personal experience, really, right? So that's the second. And thirdly, I want to say something a bit controversial. The word miracle is irrelevant in the context of science. It's irrelevant. Why? Because the scientific community in general Whenever they study a phenomenon, what is their attempt? Are they trying to figure out if this is a miracle or is there a scientific explanation behind it? What's their attempt always? To find a scientific explanation. So scientifically speaking, there's no such thing as a miracle. It has to have some sort of explanation. If you believe in miracles, then you're not truly a scientist. That's the new way of thinking. That's, that's modern thought, right? Miracles are a religious thing or common language thing, but they're certainly not a scientific thing. It's not a scientific thing. And wherever science has no answer, basically what it says is we haven't figured this out yet, but we're sure there is an explanation. But they, they, it's an unwillingness 
to take the leap of faith is what is termed usually, right? The, the, the leap of faith. So for example, in the scientific community, you may have a belief in the Big Bang. Okay, and there may be a consensus about it. But when it comes to the question of what caused the Big Bang, an average scientist will tell you, science can't answer that question, philosophy can, or religion can. We can, until we have better knowledge, that's not a question, that, it's not a scientific question. And if you were paying attention to the debate early last year, particularly in some of the northeastern states in the education system, there was a big debate between uh, the teaching of evolution versus intelligent design. Do you remember this debate? It was, it was a pretty popular debate. And essentially the argument on the scientific community's end was that you can't teach evolution, or rather uh, intelligent design, for one simple reason. And what was their reason? Anyone know? No, it's not just that it's not proof. It's a religious thought. It's a philosophical idea. It's not something that can be gauged with the five senses. Again, this, this is something you learned in like third grade. How do you come to scientific conclusions? What do you use? Yeah, the scientific method, which Im involves basically the five senses. And when you're talking about miracle, you're definitely asking people to go beyond or believe something beyond the five senses, right? So it seems like science and religion, at some point in time they collide and there doesn't seem to be any reconciliation. Either you're religious or you're scientific. And when there is, I mean, but you know, on the other hand, there is this weird phenomenon that we're finding more and more of nowadays. There are people that are scientists, but they're very religious, right? You've got, uh, you've got a very religious doctor. A doctor is a sort of a scientist or a physicist, right? But they may or may not necessarily try to merge the two things. Meaning they put their religion aside when they study science, and they put their science aside when they read Revelation, or listen to a sermon, or pray, or whatever. That's, that's a personal spiritual thing, and science is sort of like an intellectual thing. And you can't really reconcile them. Even people that are religious and scientific, many of them have this problem, right? So it's something that can't be reconciled, at least that's what it seems. But the term miracle in Islam, it has a very different connotation. By the way, before I go to miracle in Islam, I'll tell you some funny cases of miracles, um, or the word miracle being used in the news. There was a lady, I think it was four years ago, some homeless lady, she found a slice of bread under a bridge in Chicago, and it looked like Jesus. And she called it a miracle, and she sold it on eBay for a few thousand, right? Because it was a, it was a miracle slice of bread. Right? So, and this, by the way, wasn't in the you know, alert headline international news. This was in the part of the news where they show a dog surfing and like, you know, silly news. This is where it belongs. Because again, the term isn't relevant in the scientific sense. So what is a miracle in Islam? The classical scholars of Islam listed many conditions for something to be considered a miracle according to Islamic theology. I'll give you the conditions that are agreed upon universally. Across the centuries, some conditions everybody agreed with. Those are the ones I'm going to share with you. Okay? And we're going to talk about them a little bit later on. And see if you can remember them if you're not writing them down. The first one is it's impossible for human beings to do or perform. A miracle has to be something that can't be manufactured. It's not skills. It's not a trick. It's not technology. It has no possibility to have come or it couldn't have originated from a human being. It just can't. It's impossible. If you were to see it, and just to give you a crazy example, if somebody's, for example, floating, which is crazy, we wouldn't think of that happening. But if they are, that's normally not something human beings can do without a device, right? Or a baby speaking, and I think all of you know what I'm referring to, right? And that's not something human beings can do. The day of your birth you speak, right? That's not something you can do. Or being born of a virgin mother, Something human beings can't do. So it has to be beyond human capability. The second thing, which is different from the first, is that it breaks the laws of nature. There are certain patterns in life and we observe them. Science is a great way to observe them. Gravity, simple things from the ancients like fire burns, right? And here you have Ibrahim or Abraham السلام, being thrown into the fire, but does it burn? No. So that would be considered miraculous. 
So it has to be something that you can't explain from nature. But there is an added thing that I don't know if I put in the latter points here. It defies patterns of history. It was never done before, it can't be done again. Meaning it's something that stands out in history. You could say it's possible that it might happen again, but it hasn't. And it never did before it. Meaning it's, it stands out uniquely in human history. Which is sort of like what I'm saying when I say it can't be repeated. It cannot be duplicated. Actually, probably duplicated is a better word than repeated here. It can't be duplicated. Now, why would a, an amazing card trick not be considered a miracle in, Islamic, in the Islamic sense? Because someone else can do it too. Right? More than a person can do it. But it's something that you can't reproduce. It's not something that you can come up with over and over and over again. It's a one-time thing. That's it. And this is part of its condition. This is a unique condition in Islam. We don't consider anything a miracle except something that is being claimed by a person who himself claims to be a messenger of God, of course, of Allah. A prophet, specifically a messenger. The word prophet is uh, more general. The word messenger is more specific. This one's just common sense. It doesn't contradict the messenger. I'll give you an example from Islamic history. We're not going to discuss miracles in the, in the overall sense yet. But you know, there was a man at the time of the Prophet wasallam in Islamic history. Uh, he claimed to be a prophet. He said, well, Muhammad has pretty good popularity. If I claim to be a messenger, maybe I can be pretty popular too. So he decides he's going to claim to be a messenger. His name was Musaylama al-Kadhab, right? And in that same time, the Prophet وسلم, was brought a child who was very sick. And actually then he was, it was, first he was taken to a well that was almost dried up. And he was asked to help and pray that this well recovers because the town was suffering from it. So the Prophet وسلم, he prayed, he made dua, and he spit in that well and it became overflowing, as the narration goes. Musaylim al kadhab on the other hand, his town was also having a drought. So his people said, you're a messenger too, you can pull this off. And so his, their well was half dry and he spit it in it. As soon as he does, the narration goes, the well dried up completely. So what I, what I mean by contradicts the messenger is, you're performing something and what you're doing contradicts the fact that you are a messenger of Allah. It's doing the exact opposite of what you claim to be. But probably the biggest condition, and this is the one that the scholars emphasize the most, and I put it at the end, is that it challenges mankind. The point of a miracle isn't to show you something really cool and say, wow, that was awesome. The point of it in Islam, in our belief, it's always been since the beginning of mankind, any prophet, any messenger that was given miracles, the point of it was, miracles are bring, the, the, rather the messengers are bringing something really crazy. And I, before you can appreciate the last point, I'm going to give you a scenario. Picture yourself in this time. Picture yourself living a couple of thousand years ago, you know, you live in a village and there's a person living next to you. Generally, middle-aged man, maybe 40 years old. Nice guy, you've known him your whole life. Very wise person in the community. One day, he comes over to your house, knocks on your door and says, Last night, an angel came into my house and gave me revelation that I am a messenger of God. And whatever I say from now on isn't actually me speaking, I'm just representing the message of God. So if you reject me, or deny anything I'm saying, it's the same as you denying who? God Himself. And nothing I say is open to criticism any longer. Whatever I have to say is, I'm not divine myself, but whatever I have to say is representative of a divine authority. And you have to listen and obey me alone over everyone else. And if you don't, you will be This is your neighbor. What do you say to him? What do you say? Nowadays you'd call 911, right? <laughs> if you were nice, you'd say, what did you eat last night? Or are you on any medication? Or you'd, pretty much your first assumption would be what? This person is crazy. That's crazy. Why is that so crazy though? I want you to think, why would you and I 
have that as our first reaction. Why do you think that's crazy? I need to hear this. Yeah. Because there's no tangible empirical evidence to show that that's true. That there's no tangible empirical evidence, but it goes a step further. Yeah. Because we know that No, even, I'm saying 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that, very good. You can't trust something that just a person just comes and tells you. But it's, it's more extreme than that. I mean, the claim is pretty strong, right? There's a very simple reason, yeah. It's not questionable. And how can human beings shut their minds off? By definition, we are programmed to think. And he's asking us not to think anymore. So this is not acceptable. There, but there's even a more core, more basic, very simple, common sense reason. Yes? Is your observation of someone saying, believe everything you say, you see that happening a lot, and most of the people saying it by definition have to be wrong? Exactly. Statistics. You have never seen anything like this ever being true in your life. Nor does anyone else you know know of anything like this in their lifetime. Nor has it ever been recorded in reliable history that you can think of. This is a completely unheard of phenomenon, something way beyond our, your experience, something you definitely don't consider normal behavior. You know, in, in abnormal psych, day one the professor comes in and says the, differ the difference between normal versus abnormal behavior. In the society that you live in, a claim like that by anyone, even one in a million would be considered what? Absolutely abnormal behavior. This is not a norm. It defies what you accept to be normal behavior. It cannot be taken seriously. So we have lots of reasons to reject this man. And by the way, if you, leave, if you read Quran, also other uh, scripture, previous scripture, what do you find about messengers? What did the people call them? What did the people call the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Magician, insane, right? Possessed. Does it make a little more sense now why would they would say something like that? Because what he's asking them to believe, okay, believing in one God, it's not very far-fetched. Believing in a hereafter, possible. The biggest, the hardest thing to believe is what? That the one that just, I can't see it happening, is what? A man being spoken to by an angel. That just, it goes, it's beyond me. I can't accept that, right? That's the first reaction of many, many people. So in order for people to, to, in order for their decision to be facilitated, in order for them to make that leap, not of faith, but with open eyes, Islam says, there were miracles sent. The point of which was simply this. You think I'm crazy? Let me show you something God gave me, that is, it's, as soon as you see it, it's clear and evident, nobody else could have given me this except God Himself. And this is the biggest proof that I am speaking the truth. Now, believe it, whether you believe it or not, put yourself in the hypothetical situation. If you were in a time when a man came and claimed to be a messenger of Allah, a messenger of God, and he says to you, believe that I'm a messenger, and you say, what's your evidence? I mean, how should, why should I believe you? And he says, you look at this boulder right here, go check if it's a real boulder or not, you check, it's a boulder, a big giant boulder. And you say, I'm gonna pray, and by God's permission, a, a camel's gonna come out of it. Which prophet am I talking about? Salih, alayhi salam, right? And a camel comes out of a boulder. What would you say? Fine. <laughs> I mean, you, you're first, maybe it's magic, maybe it's a trick with my eyes, so you verify, and you look, and you, in the end you have to say, this can't be. This is beyond you know, anything I've ever seen. Then Maryam alayhi salam, Mary comes to the people with the baby, with Jesus, with Isa alayhi salam, and people are accusing her of wrongdoing. And in Islam, this is something I don't think is in Christian scripture, but it is an Islamic tradition. Isa alayhi salam, or Jesus, in defense of his mother, speaks on the first day he's born, defending his mother and saying, I'm a messenger of Allah. She's innocent of the crime you accuse her of. So now, if you didn't believe, if you see a one-day-old baby making a speech, public speech, then start over? No? no? Keep going? Cool. If you see a baby making a public speech on the first day he's born, then you'd probably be a believer. <laughs> or, I mean, you've seen the Prince of Egypt, I'm sure. 
If you were there when that water split, I'm sure that would turn you into a believer. Okay, this is actually a messenger of Allah, right? A messenger of God. This is beyond human capacity. It meets these conditions that I'm giving you. Right? But there's only one problem with all of this. In our time, I mean these are all of course, allegedly legends of ancient times. Stories made up. There was actually a PBS documentary, I think a couple of nights ago, on, uh, on Moses and the, 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 the exodus, whether it actually happened or not. And they're you know, scientifically trying to explain that it's actually probably legend passed down and, it, and with every generation it got exaggerated to the point where it turned into the water parting. And that's their explanation of the exodus. right? But if you and I in our day and age were to believe in a miracle, we would have to see something beyond science. Something that just can't be explained otherwise. And that would make a believer out of me or of you. Because we're living in an intellectual age. We're living in a scientific age. The age of faith that just... It was like the atmosphere around the entire earth. No matter where on the earth you went, what culture you visited, people were religious. Whether they believed in one God or many, they were religious. That culture is slowly changing very fast. As much religion as you see in the world today, there is this new movement that over a few, I mean, it's the second century of this movement now, late into the, actually in the, in the middle of its third, that now people are bigger believers in science than they are in religion, even if they're religious people. Even if they are religious people. So we're living in an age of questioning and reasoning and asking, you know, seeking intellectual answers. Now, does everybody understand these conditions of what constitutes a miracle in the Islamic sense? Okay, good. The word miracle. In the Arabic sense, the classical scholars, Islamic scholars, use the word mu'jiza. I put the apostrophe there for ayn. Mu'jiza. But it's used only by scholars of Islam. It's not a religious word. Meaning it doesn't appear in the Quran. It doesn't appear in any statement of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. What does mu'jiza mean? Mu'jiza, the word itself means that which incapacitates the opponent. Something that is used to overpower the opponent. And they use this term because the idea is the miracle of Islam, which we're going to discuss in a little bit, is something whoever argues with it is incapacitated. That's the argument. And centuries of scholarship are dedicated just to this one subject. Mu'jiza. The mu'jiza of Islam. But the word used in religious text in Quran and also in the Sunnah. Instead of mu'jiza, the word used is ayah. The word ayah in Arabic means, actually mu'jiza you would probably literally translate into English as a miracle. Ayah, however, is translated as two things. It means a miracle and it means a sign. Miracle and sign. And so a good translation of ayah that alludes to both would be a miraculous sign. That would probably be a good translation of the word ayah. In the Qur'an, the smallest, or let's go with the biggest. The biggest unit is a seventh. The unit under that is a surah. Surah is kind of like a chapter, but not exactly. What's the smallest unit in the Qur'an? Ayah. Every, I'm not going to use the word verse again, but just so you understand, every verse in the Qur'an is called, not a verse, but an ayah. It's called an ayah. And actually using the word verse has some uh, implications that I personally am not convinced of, of using the word verse. Because for those of you who speak English as their first language, where do you hear the word verse? There are two main contexts where the word verse is used. Poetry, music, song, where else? One more place. The Bible. And the Quran is very emphatic in de denying two things. At least two things. Number one, it's not poetry. Number two, it's not borrowed from previous scripture. Right? So it becomes important for us not to use that term because it already comes with a connotation that the Qur'an very emphatically denies. So verse is not to be used, rather ayah is to be used. Which I, what, what translation did I offer you? Miraculous sign. Okay, so I discussed the difference between these two words. But I want to get to the more meaty part of the discussion. Miracles of the past prophets. What are some of their miracles? 
You tell me. That's the only thing I put under here. Let's hear it. Do you know any miracles of prophets from previous nations that you've heard of? Other than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Don't mention Muhammad's miracles Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. You were saying something? What's the miracle? The miracle of, I mean, Oh, the story with the staff and the snake, yeah? Very good. Somebody mentioned the sea, the parting? Very good. What else? Think of other people. There are other miracles. Yeah. What was his miracle? Yes, he did. But it wouldn't be considered a miracle. You know why not? Figure out why not, from what the conditions of a miracle are. What are the conditions of a miracle? This is consensus among the Islamic scholars. The other paranormal phenomenon that's discussed in Revelation are called kharafat, karamat, there are other words for them. Miracles, mu'jizat, have a very specific definition. And I want to, spec- in the Islamic sense, what's a miracle? And why wouldn't Solomon speaking or Sulaiman salam speaking to animals be considered a miracle? Yeah. You're missing the question. The question is, according to the definition of what's an Islamic miracle, why isn't he speaking to animals considered a miracle? The biggest reason, yeah. Not just that, well, it was God granted, but he didn't challenge mankind with it. He didn't take this to people and say, believe in me because I can speak to animals. But he did do something on the subject of Suleiman. He did do something that was there to convince someone of Islam, to challenge someone. Yeah. He did. But there's something bigger. Something that, he, yeah. The throne of Queen Sheba. He had it transported from her kingdom to his. And then she took shahada. So that would constitute a miracle. Okay. So we've got some idea of miracles of the past prophets. What do these miracles have in common? They have three things in common. I said two here, but I really meant three. What are three things these miracles have in common? First of all, they're stuck in time. What that means is, you can tell me that Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, cured the blind by Allah's permission. And what's the easy refutation? Very easy refutation. No, no he didn't. It's not a very good refutation. <laughs> but an intellectual refutation. It's, it's a second grade refutation, yeah. This, uh, today, there, you can go around the world and there are thousands of uh, acclaimed miraculous healings, but they're all either are things that can you know, spontaneous remission with a psychological element someone can't see very well. You're going too deep, though you're right, but there's something else. Yeah. You can ask the person to falsify it, and it can't be falsified. You're on the right track. Were you there? Simple as that. Were you there? Where'd you get this from? Well, I read it in a book. How do you know it's true? I don't know. I just believe. Well then, don't, don't prove it to me. That's not proof. That's your personal belief. Keep it to yourself. Simple as that. It's pretty easy. All, all the person, all the arguer has to say, among many other things, is what? You were not there. Alright. So I'm going to give you some uh, things about science. And I'll leave you with language because personally I'm a student of language. Of the Arabic language. I continue to be. And it is something that fascinates me. Of all the things that make me convinced of Quran, it's the language. That just beyond anything else is... Uh, very profound, it has a profound impact on me. I didn't get the time to animate this, so I'll just write a, I just wrote a quick clarification. Uh, the Quran is not a book of science. It is a book that has a very specific message. The specific message is to accept God not just as a divine being, but as someone who has direct control and impact over your life, to accept the moral principles that He delivers to you, to implement them in your life so that your worldly and afterworldly, otherworldly life are a success. And this is the basic message of the Quran, salvation. And it includes many unscientific statements. 
I mean, the Quran speaks of, I put some things in parentheses, but I mean, you know others, the unseen, the unseen realm, another, another world, a world of angels and jinn. Jinn, I wouldn't want to call them demons for those of you who don't know what that is, but um, if you know the story of Aladdin, you, they use the word genie. It comes from the Arabic word jinn, and the story is an Arab legend. But the jinn is a creature we believe made of fire, like angels are made of light. And they are also creatures of choice, they can do right or wrong. That's another subject. And of course the hereafter is very unscientific. To believe in a day of judgment, to believe in a hellfire, to believe in a paradise. There's no empirical evidence to prove a paradise and gardens and you know, eternal life and all the, this sort of stuff. And of course we eat and in paradise we don't go to the bathroom, we sweat perfume. It's paradise, right? So very unscientific to someone who doesn't believe. Um, then we have to understand why is this subject taking momentum in recent times, science and Quran. It is really because the Quran, by it I mean the Quran, speaks of Allah's creation with the intent of inspiring reflection on the creation's beauty. And reflection on the subtlety, the, the mechanics, the design, the technology of creation, the technology behind a single leaf, the symmetry involved, the advanced technology in a single cell or an atom, how precise that is, right? It wants people to reflect on the subtlety of Allah's design and Allah's creation. That's where these phenomenon, worldly phenomenon, creations of Allah or, or God are mentioned. And in later times, and this is the, the point that hits the, this is the one that hits my home, the miracle is in the choice of words used or given to describe the creation. What I mean by that is, the Qur'an I st said before is the literal word of Allah, meaning every word is divinely chosen. Arabic is unique because for any given word you have dozens of synonyms, dozens and dozens of synonyms, each with a slight like uh, difference, very slight difference. So you have for example eight words for falling asleep. And the difference between all of them is one of them is deep sleep, the other one is almost asleep, but your eyes are open but your mind is sleeping. The other one is you're sleeping but you can hear people. The other one is, you know, and you're sleeping when you're sitting, you're sleeping when you're lying down. Different stages of sleep, asleep with dreams in it, asleep without dreams in it. They've got a word for each of them. And I'm giving you a phrase for each of them, asleep with something, asleep with something. Arabs have a word for each of these types of sleep. Arabs have a word for different types of, different uh, ways to describe a farmer. They have a word for farmer when he's planting the seed. They've got a word for farmer when he's taking out the seed. They've got a word for farmer when he's watering the plants. And they're all used for farmer. But they're very specific about words, very, very specific. And the miracle aspect that's now more recently being talked about is in the precision of the choices of words used to describe things you would almost think in passing. Meaning Allah is talking about something like, you know, uh, the creation of something. And just the way in which He talks about it in and of itself becomes uniquely miraculous. And I, I put some Arabic here, don't be intimidated, I'll tell you what that is. That's for me, not for you. Some simple examples. Uh, one interesting example is Surah Al-Hadid. Um, and by the way, Sheikh Zanadani, who's a famous scholar in the Arab world, collects over 350 scientific phenomena in the Quran. Um, but I'm not going to give you 350. I'll give you one, two, three, four, five. And just point you in the direction when we talk about Quran and science, what it's, what's it referring to. So this ayah says, وَأَنزَلَ Hadid." Surah Al-Hadid is surah number 57 of the Quran. And Allah uses the word, we sent down iron. We sent down iron. Now, the thing of it is, Allah speaks about creating lots of different things in the Quran. But for all of them, He uses a verb called khalaqa or to create. He created the heavens and the earth. He created life and death. He created, He created, He created. But when He speaks of iron, He didn't say He created it. He said, what did I say? He sent it down. He sent it down. And scholars of the past were grappling with this issue. Why? Because, you know, the words of God are very precise. This is our belief. So when someone would argue, what he sent, he sent it down. He meant he created it. No, if he meant he created it, he would have said, he created it. He didn't mean that. He meant specifically that he sent it down. Right? And so you find in this, in the last century, in the 20th century, geologists coming to certain agreements about the beginnings of the earth. One of them being that 
iron was not is not uh, is not part of the original earth. It actually came to the earth in the form of meteors, and was buried deep into the core of the earth. Right. So the word used iron, we sent down iron, becomes a very accurate depiction of the reality of iron because it was sent down. Another example is in Surah Al-Furqan, that's Surah number 25. وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا وَقَمَرًا مُنِيرًا Allah speaks of things in the heavens and the earth that are at His disposal. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ بُرُوجًا Blessed is the one who placed uh, in the sky stars. And then he says, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا And in the sky he placed, for, particularly for us, a lamp. He calls the sun a lamp in this case, Siraj. وَقَمَرًا munira. The words Qamaram munira are describing the moon. The word Qamar means moon, uh, moon. But the word Munir is the one that's really scientific, and if you want to take it that way. The word Munir means something given light. Something illuminated. Not something that gives off light, but something that is lit up by something else. Like this room is Munir, this room is lit up because of the light. But the light itself is Siraj. So there's the source of light and the recipient of the light. When he spoke of the sun, he called it a lamp. When he spoke of the moon, he called it a, a moon that reflects light. So at a time when this is not a known phenomenon, Allah is speaking of the moon as a body in space that doesn't give off its own light. As I mean, nowadays, obviously it's reflecting the sun's light. But I mean, picture yourself 1500 years ago saying that. It's not very obvious. Looks like it's giving off its own light. Right? But then it's the, the, the direct statement, وَقَمَرَ munira. This third one is... Um, cross between linguistic and scientific. I'll just mention the linguistic aspect of this very quickly because it's not a big deal. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the only people surrounding him were people of either um, uh, you know, idol worshipping people, atheists, Christians and Jews. The Christians and Jews were the more knowledgeable people. The idol worshippers were not an intellectual people, they were Bedouins in the Arab society. Even the Christians and the Jews at the time believed that the earth was the center of the universe. Okay? And this ayah comes down and says that uh, the beginning of the ayah, this is Surah Yasin, Surah number 36. Um, and then this part, fi falakin yasbahun. The sun does not rebel its orbit that it may come before the moon. Neither, neither does, and so that the day may be coming early, nor does the night come before the day, meaning they've got their appointed times. But in the beginning of the ayah, he's talking about light, the, 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 um, the moon and the sun keeping their order, not coming out of their orbits. And then he talks about night and day not transgressing. When it's time for night, it's night. When it's time for day, it's day. And they don't transgress each other. They keep their limits. So far, he's talking about the sun and the moon and the earth and time. Right? But then he says, وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ And all of them, all of them meaning the earth, the moon, and the sun. Because these are the three objects mentioned in the ayah. All of them are floating in their own orbits. وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ All of them, falak means orbit. يَسْبَحُونَ To swim or to float. So all of them in their own orbits, they are floating. Now at the time, one belief was, the closer the scientific belief was, the sun is at the center of the universe. And yet Allah is going a step further at this time, 1500 years ago, and what's He saying? The earth has an orbit, the moon has an orbit, and the sun has an orbit. Right? Way ahead of its time. And this is the theme in scientific phenomena in the Qur'an. It's not talking about uh, something so amazing to you now, but it's something to wonder that how is such an accurate depiction being given of a only lately discovered scientific phenomenon or scientific phenomenon discovered much later to be mentioned in this text. And it's not something, again, this is not something that was boasted or talked about or, you know, um, as soon as, for example, in, the, in, in Europe, in, there were other discoveries, Galileo and things like that. These discoveries did not lead Muslim scholars to say, aha, the Qur'an's been saying this all along. Because it was like, oh yeah, we knew that. <laughs> the book says it already. It wasn't something, a, a big deal. And I'm saying that because the scientific is only a recent emphasis 
we shouldn't go overboard with the scientific thing. I'm just mentioning some phenomena that are commonly talked about, but it's not necessarily something you constantly you know, uh, push. Then there's of course the famous ayah about the heavens and the earth, which is the Arabic expression for the universe, heavens and the earth. كَانَتَا رَتْقًا The word رَتْقًا in Arabic means something that is fused and inseparable. Fused and inseparable. The word ratq was used when a mother is carrying a child because the mother and the child are inseparable. And when she would start delivering, the other was, word was used, fataqa. Fataqa is the part, the time for her to start parting. Literally, her body is parting up and she's parting from her child. So the ayah says the heavens and the earth used to be fused and inseparable and then we caused them to come apart. Meaning, there was the universe in, the, in origin, in, original, in its original form, was a fused, united body, some sort of matter, and then it became and spread out, and then the words used later on, it spread out far and wide. So it's close to, very close to, uh, interestingly close to, the Big Bang Theory. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the beginning of the heavens and the earth. And of course from the biological perspective, there's the description of the embryo. I'm not going to go into that one. Because that's a, it's a nice PhD thesis. It's out from a professor, I think Mustafa Ahmed, um, who shows the correlation between the linguistic analysis of the ayah, the, the ayah that talks about the stages of the embryo versus modern science and how that's looked upon. But I'll give you one last one. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ and we made from water every living thing. The basis of life, water. Again, something stated way ahead of its time. Now I'm going to go to the part that I like to go over. The linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. This is hard for me to explain to people that don't know Arabic, but try to follow along with me. I'll try to make it as easy as I possibly can. This is the third ayah of surah number 74. Surah number 74, of course, is surah al-Muddathir. And it says, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And declare the greatness of your Lord. What's unique about this ayah, the word wa, you notice the shape here and the shape here are the same? Right? For those of you who don't read Arabic, at least you can tell the shapes, right? This is sort of the Arabic symbol for the sentence beginning. In English you have the capital letter that starts off a sentence. In Arabic, among the many usages of the word wa, the letter wa, one of them is that it starts off a new statement. And what I've done here is I've separated the letters. See this shape over here? And that ending shape is similar, it's over there. Right? And then this one's got a dot underneath it, and this one's got a dot underneath it. Right? And that one's got a dot underneath it, and this one's got a dot. So what I've basically done, in Arabic you merge the letters when you write them, but I've written them here in separated form. For those of you who know Arabic, what letter is this? Go on. What's the first letter? What's the last letter? What's the second letter? What's the last letter? Second last. Third one? Third last one? Find the middle. Declare the greatness of your Lord Backwards and forwards the same way Okay Palindromes Now, it's fun to make palindromes in any language <laughs> Ba You know, dad It's fun Try saying something you want to say In a sentence that is spelled backwards and forwards the same way without having to change what you want to say. Sound possible? At least highly unlikely. <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. This is one dimension of the, the, the uh, miracle of the Arabic language, the linguistics in Qur'an. I'll give you an even more profound example in my opinion. I'm going to come out of the full screen version here. Because I want to... Let's help you understand something easier. Okay, once again, I'm going to try to simplify this as much as I can. Wait, I went too far. Sorry, I ruined it for you. But most of all, hold on. Okay. Alright. You notice 
the word wa again, sentence beginning. Kul is kaf and lam, that's separated here. Fi is fa, and this two dot thing is here. Then fa lam kaf, fa lam kaf. I didn't put yasbahun. Let me translate this for you. We just talked about this ayah a second ago. This is the ayah that says they're all floating in their own orbits. Rotating in their own orbits. The word for rotating or floating used is yasbahun. I want you to remember what letter it begins with. Yeah, okay. So the action, the verb, if I give you the English, all of them are floating or rotating in their own orbits. What's the action? What's the verb? Floating. Okay. When you take the beginning letters and you separate them, kaf in the beginning, kaf at the end. You notice the symbols are the same? Lam in the beginning, second last, lam third last, fa, fa. And they're all rotating around what letter? Which is the word for rotating? Yes, bahun. The letter that begins off begins the word for rotating. They're rotating around it. Subhanallah. They form a symmetrical pattern. This is a second example. And of course, I'll add one more complication to this. I said to you, produce a sentence of something you want to say. Something you want to say. And try to say it in a way that is spelled backwards and forwards the same way. Not to mention you can't write it down. You can't write it down. And the interesting thing is, this wasn't discovered and a dozen of these were not discovered until after the Qur'an was published, libraries, and you know, many many scholars, generations later scholars said, wait a second, they're doing letter counts of Qur'an, because scholarship was done on Qur'an from every perspective, and they started discovering this. Meaning the Prophet himself didn't claim, hey look at this ayah, backwards and forwards, he didn't say that. It's something that came much later. And yet it was always there. For subhanallah. This one's not 74.3, it's 36. I think 36.30? In the 30s somewhere. So that was an example of palindromes in the Quran. I want to give you some easy examples. This is very complicated, but I'm going to again try to simplify it as much as I can. Uh, the first ayah, I'll read the Arabic. Wala taqtulu awladakum. For those of you who read Arabic, what's the, let's read this together again. Wala taqtulu awladakum. Read the beginning here. Wala taqtulu awladakum. The word imlaq is here. What's the word here? Imlaq. But before imlaq, over here there is a min and there is a khashyata over here. There's a slight difference. And if you look at the ending, nahnu is here and nahnu is here. Narzuku is here and narzuku is here. But there's a kum here and there's a hum here. And there's a hum here and there's a kum here. So there's a little bit of a change. But mostly the ayah is the same. These are two different citations from two different surahs in the Quran. I'll tell you what they mean. The top one means don't kill your children because of poverty. We're the ones who provide you, you all, and not to mention them. I'll say that again. And don't kill your children because of poverty. We are the ones who provide you all and not to mention them. Let's look at the second one. Don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. We are the ones who provide them and you. Did you hear a difference in the English? You have to pay attention to know. There are two differences. The first one said because of poverty. The second one says out of fear of poverty. The first one says we provide you and them. The, first, the second one says we provide them and you. Which to an English listener, even an Arabic listener, same idea. I mean, out of fear of poverty, because of poverty, what's the big deal? It's the same thing, right? But if you pay a little bit closer attention, this is actually where the linguistic discussion on Quran is the most in depth. In these ayat that are similar, and in translation, even in Arabic, you would hardly notice the difference in meaning. But if you dig a little deeper from the linguistic perspective, you discover something great. And that is, the word min, in classical Arabic, which is because of, I translate it as because of, is used as min ajil, harf ajil it's called. It's a, it's a word used to describe uh, a reason. 
And it impl the implication here is the ayah is talking to people that are already poor. Because they're killing their children because of poverty, meaning it already exists. If they are already poor, then they are worried about their own food in their stomach first. Before even thinking about kids. So when Allah says, don't kill your children because of poverty, who does He provide first? You, because you're poor yourself, and also them. The next ayah says fear of poverty. And fear in any language, particularly in Arabic, is always associated with the future. I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid to get late to work. I'm afraid of failing the class. I'm afraid of a car accident. You're afraid of stuff that hasn't happened yet. The implication directly here is, you're not poor yet. You're not poor yet. Here, what was it? You're already poor. So if you're not poor yet, and you're killing your children, what is it telling you? That we are worried we won't be able to afford them. So when these people are spoken to, what does Allah say? We provide them, not to mention you. For the shallow look, at a shallow look, you and them, them and you, what's the difference? On just a more subtle, careful look, you will notice the accuracy of the order and how it reflects the meaning that is to be communicated. Two different groups in society are committing the same sin for two different reasons. One reason is outlined here and one reason is outlined here. What takes me 20 minutes to explain to you is just in the change of two words. This is divine speech. The accuracy, the subtlety of speech and how it co communicates very very specific meaning. This is one of my favorite examples. This is for those of you who read the Qur'an a lot. You'll enjoy this one inshallah. This is also to speak of the, the profound nature of the imagery in the Qur'an. Imagery in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a very connected, coherent text. One part describing the other. One theme being repeated in different words. Now you notice in this ayah Allah says, I put the translation here, يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ He knows what enters into the earth, وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا And what comes out of it, وَمَا يَنزِلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And what comes down from the sky, وَمَا يَعْرُجُ فِيهَا And what rises to it, وَهُوَ الرَّحِيمُ الْغَفُورِ And he is the constantly merciful, exceedingly, I missed the word forgiving. Exceedingly forgiving. If you read Qur'an, what do you always read? غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ or رَحِيمٌ غَفُورٌ you always read Ghafoor and Rahim, forgiving merciful, forgiving merciful, forgiving merciful. That's the theme in the Quran. Over 70 times you will find an ayah ending Ghafoor and Rahim. In Allah kana Ghafoor and Rahima. Okay? Wallahu Ghafoor and Rahim. This is the only place, and again, what Ghafoor and Rahim means is forgiving, comma, merciful. This is the only place in the entire Quran that says merciful, comma, forgiving. This is the only place. And it's divine speech, right? Every word is in our belief is in its place. How come this is the only place that doesn't say forgiving, comma, merciful, rather says merciful, comma, forgiving? First of all, I'll tell you what one of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah, said about this ayah. He said, every time Allah says forgiving, comma, merciful, at the end of an ayah, at the end of a statement, the beginning of it always has mention of human beings. The beginning of it always talks about in human beings one way or the other. And that's important to note because as far as human beings are concerned, they need to be forgiven first, then they become deserving of mercy. That's the proper order as far as human beings are concerned. Forgiving, then mercy. And he gave the analogy of a glass. You know, in, uh, in Arabic, the statement is in Dar al Mafsada Muqaddam ala Jalbil Maslaha, which means if you have a dirty glass and you want to drink, say, juice, what do you have to do first before you can use the glass? Clean out the negative element before you can add the positive element. Forgiveness cleans out the negative element. Mercy is obviously the positive element, right? So the, uh, forgiveness comes first, mercy comes second. This is the only place in the whole Quran. Um, I'd be very impressed if you know where this is from. Nope. You're right. يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ is mentioned in Surah Al-Hadid, but this is not it. No one knows? Okay, I'll give you the number, you tell me the name. Surah number 34. Figure it out one day. Very good, Sabah. Surah Sabah. 
I number 2. 34, 2. Okay. This one, if you read the English translation, do you see mention of human beings? Are human beings being mentioned? Not directly. Not directly. If you were to indicate the literal, if you, at the outer meaning of this ayah, the obvious theme of the ayah is the knowledge of God. He knows what goes into the earth, what comes out of the earth, what comes down from the sky, what goes up into the sky. The theme is knowledge. All over the Qur'an, whenever knowledge is mentioned, somewhere in the passage there is also mercy. Knowledge and mercy are affiliated terms in the Qur'an. Because God's knowledge, Allah's knowledge in the end is mercy. The biggest example of that is Ar-Rahman. You know the next one? Allama al-Qur'an. The exceedingly merciful taught the Qur'an. Knowledge, education, right? And there are many other instances. But more than that, if there is no mention of human beings, then why is... Mercy is understandable because that's universal. Forgiveness is particularly an attribute that affects who? Human beings. If there is no mention of human beings, then there is no need for ghafoor. But there is mention of human beings. It's implied. You know in the beginning when Allah says He knows what enters into the earth, the farmer thinks of what going into the earth? What's planted into the earth? The seed. And what comes out? A plant. But at a deeper look, we also enter into the earth one day. And we will also be coming out of the earth one day, day of judgment. Remember that again. He knows what enters into the earth, could refer to plants, but also refers to human beings, because they, are, they certainly enter into the earth, and they will certainly be coming out. If you look at the next part, he says what comes down from the sky. From a farmer's perspective, what is coming down from the sky? Rain. But from the perspective of revelation, it is the words of Allah, revelation, angels, that are also coming down from the sky. That's mercy. But uh, let me not give you that parallel yet. So revelation comes from the sky. Revelation comes, people decipher it, they act according to it, or they don't act according to it. What goes back up to the sky? Their deeds for evaluation. Let's do that again. Human beings enter the earth, will come out of the earth. Revelation comes down from the sky, and what goes up? Deeds go up to the sky. Now, once again, at the time of death, human beings are in need of Allah's mercy. When they are raised, they will be in need of Allah's forgiveness. On the Day of Judgment, we all need forgiveness. So, mercy first, forgiveness second. What comes down from the sky again? Revelation. Revelation is mercy. What goes up to the sky again? Deeds need what? Forgiveness. Mercy first, forgiveness second. The only place in Quran where mercy is first, forgiveness is second. For subhanallah. Very accurate use of words. Precisely in their place. And this, these are just small examples of, you know, what happened in the beginning, I'll tell you what happened historically. The subject became such an obsession with Islamic scholars. In the beginning, the papers used to be aqidah based papers or creed papers and books and, and doctrines where they would write saying, this is what proves that this is the word of Allah. And for two or three centuries, this was the theme. And then the scholars got tired of that theme saying, we don't need to prove it anymore. Let's just explore its beauty. <laughs> so the theme became, the, the theme later on is Jamad al-Quran rather than I'jaz al-Quran. The beauty of the Quran. Let's explore the Allah. They didn't even delve into that much anymore after a couple of centuries. So you find most of this discussion really in the context of just exploring the Qur'an's beauty in that subtle capacity. What, makes, what adds complication to this however is the fact that it's not being expanded upon or explained or articulated by the Prophet ﷺ only by the scholars who are exploring the language later on. Right? And yet his choice of words are always on point because they're not his. They are Allah's words. They are Allah's words. You know an author has a time to write something and edit it and modify it and edit it and modify it. With the Prophet of Allah with Qur'an, it's memorized as it is, cover to cover. And then there is no editing modification. It, this is it. It's just memorized as it is. So this is one you know, profound example of... Oh, I did have forgiving in there. Last example. 
I wanted to give you a couple of things. There's some papers against this. I did some research on my own. Um, Allahu alam. How? There it is. Okay. There's a man by the name of Muhammad uh, ibn Tariq al-Swaydan, or Tariq ibn Muhammad al-Swaydan, who did a paper on the, or did a lecture series, 12 hours on the miracles of the Quran in Arabic, um, in Kuwait. Very interesting paper. He, he did over 50 miracles scientifically. But I want to share with you the word count in the Quran. Um, I verified five of these and then I gave up. So there's no point. You can verify them if you want, inshallah. I may have some of the numbers wrong, but I know they're equals. Uh, I made them have them because I just listened directly to the lecture. I didn't get it off a website or anything. Okay. Oh, I didn't share the coolest one with you yet. Sorry. Two more. This is one, and then I'll share one last one with you. The word prayers in the plural, salawat, prayers, is mentioned, interestingly, in the whole Qur'an only five times. Which of course matches what? The number of times you have to pray. The word dunya, which means this world, is mentioned 150 times, 15 times. And so is the word the hereafter. Akhira. Angels are mentioned 99 times. And these are not, you know, um, word counts that are sort of imposed on the Qur'an because the Qur'an is not, there are no versions, there's one text and word searches were done in classical texts, Ma'ajim, you know, Kitab al-Ma'ajim and there are other books that did word counts of Qur'an they didn't do it to find equals but what this scholar did was as he was looking through the word counts he was finding some equals and he just listed them you can take it as a miracle, you can't, but certainly it's something very unique and profound Angels and devils are mentioned an equal number of times in the Qur'an. Life and death is mentioned an equal number of times, both 145 times. The people and the messengers are mentioned an equal number of times. Why? Because the messengers came for all the people. Iblis, and, or, uh, Iblis is the old name of shaitan and seeking refuge from him, both mentioned 11 times. Zakah and Barakah mentioned equal number of times. The Prophet Muhammad's name mentioned four times. Sharia mentioned four times. Right? So you've got these themes that are connected with each other and the term, the day and night by the way, same number of times. Man and woman, 24 times each. The intellect and light, same number of times. So you've got these terms that are related that are mentioned an equal number of times. But again, this is a recited word. This was something that was memorized. Memorized first and foremost. And even when it was available in the earliest generations in documented form, it was in the form of leather pouches and you know, uh, big parches, leaves, written on bones and things like that. So there was no way to do document research until much, much later. The most efficient way of preserving Qur'an was in terms of memorization. The last thing, last, last thing I promise. And then I'll let you go home. Is... This one really, when I first studied it, I had to turn uh, everything away and I just had to go pray. Because this is too much. At least for me. Let me see if I can find it. So I can show you what it is. Ikna workshop. I was doing a competition between brothers and sisters at the Ikna convention in Atlanta two days ago. Okay. For those of you who read Arabic, for those of you who don't, listen carefully to the Arabic words and see if you find a pattern. <laughs> read the first word in red. Zakariya. Next word. Khafiya. Next word. Shaqiya. Next word. Waliya. Next word. Sharqiya. Next word. Nabiya. Then. Hayya. Then. Then. Okay. What, those of you who don't speak Arabic, did you notice something? Those of you who don't speak Arabic? Did you notice anything in the way the words sounded? They all did what? They, they, they rhymed? There was a rhyme scheme? This is Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, which is like a lot of other surahs in the Quran. The words are rhyming at the ends of the verses, or the ayat rather. Okay? Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu zakariya, idh nada rabbahu nida'an. Khafiyya, etc. 
And the ayat go on and the words keep rhyming and rhyming and rhyming and rhyming until you come down and I skipped some ayat in this presentation. But read the next word in red. Yamtarun. That doesn't rhyme with khafiya or shaqiya or you know insiya. None of those words. Now it's got a different rhyme scheme. Yamtarun, fayakun, mustaqim, azim, mubin, yu'minun, yurja'un. Different rhyme scheme. So you have the first many many ayat dedicated to the same rhyme scheme. And then a different rhyme scheme all of a sudden in the same surah. When the subject was the same, the stories of the prophets, the rhyme scheme was the same. As soon as the subject changes, it's kind of like paragraph change, you know you hit space, then tab bar, move over, the indentation. Arabic didn't, the Quran doesn't have that. What does it have? A different rhyme scheme. Because the subject has changed. So the listener can know that now a new subject is being talked about. But what's interesting is, when you want to refer back to the old subject, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَدِّقًا نَبِيَّ Stories of the Prophets again. Old rhyme scheme again. A word that is not poetry. It's, it's dealing with a very serious subject. But yet for the listener who listens carefully knows the subject is one because the rhyme scheme is one. And as soon as the rhyme scheme changes, the subject has advanced to something else. And when the rhyme scheme returns, it is because that tangent was necessary to complete the original subject. SubhanAllah. Give me another document that does that consistently throughout the text. Those of you who know Surah Naba. Amma yatasa'aloon anil naba'il azim alladhi hum fihi mukhtalifoon kalla سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ One paragraph. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ Go on. وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُوَاتِ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ One subject is done, the other subject has its own rhyme scheme. And sometimes you'll have long passages with the same exact rhyme scheme with something interjecting in the middle that doesn't fit the rhyme scheme. You know why? Because that tangent is necessary for the rest of it and you have to pay attention. Allah will say, لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة يحسب الإنسان أن النجمع عظامة بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانة بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أمامه يسأل أيان يوم القيامة The subject is over. The next one فإذا برق البصر وخصف القمر وجمع الشمس والقمر يقول الإنسان يومئذ أين المفر كلا لا وزر إلى ربك يومئذ المستقر يُنَبَّأُ الْإِنسَانِ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِمَا قَدَّمْ وَأَخَّرْ The next subject بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرَةِ وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرَةِ You hear the rhymes at the ends? Then a break Because for the next subject you need to understand something else لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ And then go back سبحان الله So these are some of the linguistic dimensions of the miracle of the Qur'an. The last thing that I want to leave you with, and most of all, the Qur'an is a miracle for the exact, for the most unscientific reason. Because it transforms lives. To this day, there are people, you will, they'll be the last person you would think would be a Muslim. The last person on the face of this earth. One of my best friends in the world, his name is Abdullah, his original name is Mike, he was a neo-Nazi. Tattoos all over his body. He's memorizing Quran right now. He was actually part of... He was up there. And he was... Um, he's actually talking to a couple of gangs in uh, New York State prisons. And talking to them about Islam. Some of the head leaders of the white supremacist crew. <laughs> because they're old friends. Last person you would imagine would be a Muslim. And he's one of my best friends. And, some, and by the way, he married a black woman, by the way. And, <laughs> yeah. And they have four kids. Yeah, subhanAllah. And this man, you know how he became Muslim? He says, one day I had a fight with my mother. I punched her in the head. I got really mad at myself. So I had to find somewhere to go where the cops wouldn't look for me. So I went to the library. And... <laughs> I couldn't find anything, I had to make, you know, make myself look you know, normal, so I picked up a book and it happened to be the Qur'an. And I wasn't reading it, it was reading me. 
That's what he says. I wasn't reading it, it was reading me. And he took the shahada in the library. SubhanAllah. The, the most weirdest, weirdest experiences people have, when they read the Qur'an, it just completely transforms their, li- their lives. Where I, my daughters go to an Islamic uh, kindergarten, preschool. I started it, I was the principal first. But I quit when I, we found a suitable replacement. The replacement is a, is a woman. She's Japanese. She was born in, she was born in Japan, she, she migrated here. And she was a very um, high power executive downtown. She used to work on Wall Street. And you know how they have those vendors in Wall Street? That sell like shawarmas and stuff like that. We call them chicken guys, right? <laughs> so she was at one of those. And the guy was blasting like recitation of Quran. And she goes, that's really interesting music. Where do you get that? And the guy said, uh, actually I can, I can tell you where to go. He pointed her to Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. Where she ended up in a store and they gave her a copy of the Qur'an. And she read it and she took shahada the next day. And her two sons are memorizing Qur'an. And she's the principal of an Islamic school now. Right? Just, I mean, the most unlikely people that you would think. No conversion, no preaching, nobody went to them and say, you know, accept this or you're doomed. Nothing. They just went and read the Qur'an. And you know what's the craziest thing? After 9-11, there was a spike in conversions of people that out of curiosity started buying the co- copy of the Qur'an from Barnes & Noble. And this is not even the miraculous Arabic Qur'an. This is English translation of Qur'an. And people are just out of curiosity, what is this terrorist document? You know? And they're reading it and they're finding, how can I, how could I miss this? I just met last week, I was in Atlanta. There was a convention there in Atlanta. And I met a young man, younger than me at least. Uh, he was... Now get this, his name is, his original name is Joshua, now his name is Yusha. He's originally Irish. He was studying Orthodox Christianity, studying to become a scholar. He was studying Hebrew, Aramaic, he was studying the ancient language, Latin even, to study the Bible in its original texts. And he, studied, he heard a, uh, a sermon one day about Islam and how it's an evil religion, right? And he, he thought to himself, after all the Bible I've studied, I can't think the Bible is the truth. But one thing's for sure, of all the other religions I'm going to explore, explore, Islam will never be one of them. Because it's an evil faith. He wasn't convinced of the Bible. As, as, the more he studied it, the, the less convinced he became. And then finally one day, the funny thing is, he was studying at a church. The wall to the masjid is about a foot apart. He was studying at this place. And he used to park his car in the masjid, at the mosque, and then go to church. For 10 years he was doing this, since he was an early teen. And then one day somebody saw him and said, hey, uh, the Friday prayer is going on, because he was going on Friday to church to speak to his priest. And they didn't know that he's not a Muslim, because he's parking in the, in the, Muslim, the, the mosque parking lot. So he said, okay, whatever, I'll check it out. He goes in, listens to the sermon, takes shahada, becomes a Muslim. So this, to me at least in our times, the strangest stories of people in the Western world, People that you would never have imagined coming to Islam. This is probably, to me at least, the greatest miracle of the Qur'an. The most profound miracle of the Qur'an. This is one you can't argue away from anyone. Because they've experienced it themselves, personally. They've personally, personally experienced it themselves. Last but not least, I pray that anything that I have said was good and true. And that Allah accepts my intentions and your intentions for His cause. And I also pray that any mistakes that are made... First of all, I declare that they're my own. And second of all, I hope that you can all forgive me for my shortcomings and that Allah also forgives me for them. Barakallahu li wa lakum.